Assalamu alaikum. I welcome you again to lecture number 29 of the Public International Law Course. This course has been starting from the conceptual side of public international law, taking you through various issues of pure academic nature, and then bringing you to some very important case studies. We have studied the issue of Siachin, we have studied the legal aspects of the issue of Sir Creek, and today we shall be addressing ourselves with an issue and a dispute which has been much talked about and it is so well known that I am sure you will find the legal analysis of this issue very interesting. It is the issue of Kashmir. Today we shall look at the legal side of the issue of Kashmir. Kashmir is one thing which has always created a serious tensions between India and Pakistan. Pakistan has a very strong position on Kashmir. Historically, Pakistan maintains that Kashmir is part of Pakistan, whereas India has a different viewpoint on that. And there has been an extensive United Nations involvement. And that involvement has its own impact on the issue of dispute. Until recent past, India, which was reluctant to talk or to discuss this issue, has now even come forward enough to have an extensive discussion in the form of a composite dialogue that is going on at various levels. But for the purposes of our course, we will look at the legal side of this issue. It is an issue which is extremely emotional for Pakistan and for Pakistanis. It is something on which people are prepared to lay their lives. But as I said in my previous lectures, we shall look at this issue like any other issue from a case study point of view, from a purely legal point of view. We shall try not to make any political comments in this and we shall not tread on the political side of this issue. But we will make legal analysis of even some of the political positions that both India and Pakistan have been taking in respect of the matter of Kashmir. It is not a simple issue, of course. It is an issue which could not be resolved by United Nations. It's an issue which could not be resolved by both the countries. And there are so many solutions, there are so many options which not only have come up today but have been coming up at each time frame of history, in each time zones relating to the Kashmir issue in 70s and 60s and 50s and so on and so forth. We are not here to present a solution to that issue. We are here to understand the legality of this issue. Because the issue has become political because of legal complications involved in that. And if we do not dispassionately make an analysis of those legal issues, we shall never be able to have an informed political analysis. And the purpose of this session, for those who are prepared to take an exam on this paper, for those who are merely interested to learn about it, and for those who may want to write as academicians, as journalists, is that they should simply be able to analyze more accurately the various facets, the various subsets of the issues associated with this issue as a whole, with this dispute as a whole, without which it will not be possible to have an informed political opinion. Although I must say, you talk about Kashmir, everyone has an opinion on that. You talk about Kashmir to somebody in India, Everyone has an opinion about that. To talk about Kashmir in any country outside Pakistan, everyone would like to if uh, not take a position and definitely raise an eyebrow, which means it's an issue of serious tension of this region. And Kashmir is a kind of a dispute which has been rated at par with dispute like Palestine. And it is claimed as something which is a scar on the human conscious on the conscious of the humankind, that despite development of international law, despite development of regimes and national human rights conventions 
And despite tall claims by international organization and world powers that they stand for the right, they stand for self-determination, they stand for independence of people from other dominations. Despite all these claims, Kashmir continues to remain unresolved and it becomes thus a serious embarrassment for international community. Why is it unresolved? Why a dispute has become so complicated over a period of time? Of course, there would be political intentions behind it. We don't go into that area. And this issue, this dispute has not only complicated itself over a period of time, but it has also now become associated with a lot of other legal issues that are raised in this context. Issues like violations of human rights, issues like application of international humanitarian law, issues like terrorism versus self-determination, and so on and so forth. And it was this issue of Palestine and the issue of Kashmir that were together considered as how to draw a distinction between someone who is fighting for his legitimate right of self-determination and distinguish it from someone who is a pure terrorist. It is not an easy thing to make an effort to explain the legal propositions involved with Kashmir. I'll try and do that. It's difficult even to step or pick up a thread and say, well, I start from here. Because if you were to look at the historic perspective of Kashmir, you can go back to 200 years when the first Raja was there, when the first treaty was signed. But if you want to pick up the threads of the issue and make a discussion out of it or make a issue out of it, a proposition, frame a proposition from it, and I think the relevant time zone to start would be 1947. Let me summarize some of these frameworks. And then we'll go into some details of the legal arguments. And then we'll uh, go to certain important documents and have uh, a discussion based on the references of those documents. The issue of Kashmir is an issue which starts in 1947 in a legal sense. 1947 is also the time when United Nations is just born as an international organization which has been given the power of attorney by all the states to preserve international peace and security and to take cognizance of all events and issues that, in, that can threaten international peace and security. So UN has emerged as a very powerful organization, is keen to demonstrate its credibility and keen to establish itself for times to come. This is a time when India is being divided. And within India, there, is, there are a number of princely states. The states are being given option to join either the dominion of India or Pakistan. One such state is the state of Jammu and Kashmir. The state of Jammu and Kashmir enters into an instrument of accession through the Maharaja. Despite the fact that Jammu and Kashmir is dominantly a Muslim populated area. The Maharaja executes a legal instrument called a document of accession. In response to that document, Lord Mountbatten writes a letter in which he recognizes that this instrument of accession will be subject to the assessment of the wishes of people of Kashmir. And it is these two documents are the keys in the cornerstone of the dispute of Kashmir. Hence, Lord Mountbatten for the first time confirms that accession is conditional on the assessment of the wishes of people of Jammu and Kashmir. Then, there is, the matter goes to United Nations Security Council. And surprisingly, the matter goes to UN Security Council. At the initiative of India, Matter is discussed there extensively. Both the sides put forward their point of view. Pakistan is represented by Sir Zafullah Khan primarily, who is himself an international lawyer of great stature. As a consequence of these debates, discussions in the UN Security Council and a very 
hectic diplomatic efforts that are taken up there. A number of resolutions are passed by United Nations Security Council. And these are those resolutions which recognize that yes, the accession was conditional. It was conditional on assessing the wishes of people. UN Security Council resolutions prescribe a mode of making an assessment of the wishes of people. And that mode is plebiscite. Not only that, UN Security Council establishes a specialized body called UNCIP, UN Commission for India and Pakistan, with the exclusive purpose to make an effort to resolve this issue in, and to conduct plebiscite, and also nominates observers so as to ensure that the, that the fire when it was seized is properly observed between the forces of India and Pakistan which are lined up in Kashmir. There are a set of these resolutions and we'll go through one or two of them which start from 1948 and go up to more or less 1965 or 1957. These resolutions are then followed or in the meanwhile there are four representatives of UN Security Council which visit Kashmir, India and Pakistan to find a way to have this issue resolved because a prescription of plebiscite has been given in the UN resolutions. There are details provided for how that plebiscite shall be conducted and then there becomes a situation where it is difficult to properly resolve the implementation of these resolutions or to create circumstances which are provided in them for the conduct of the plebiscite. The said arbitrators or representatives of the UN Security Council also fail in realizing the objective of Security Council. And then we have entered into yet another phase of the Kashmir issue. When the UN, the matters are no longer taken in the United Nations for whatever political reasons, and then there is an effort to incorporate the territory of Jammu and Kashmir as it is in the occupation of India into the constitution and into the territories of India. And then that effort leads to another legal issue, whether that incorporation by virtue of Article 370 of the Indian constitution is valid in the light of the UN Security Council resolutions or not. So. There are various time zones in the study of the legal aspects of Kashmir. The first time zone is when UN resolutions were passed. Or shall we say the first primary time zone was when the dispute actually came up sharply in focus by virtue of instrument of accession, letter by Lord Mountbatten. The phase two is when the matter goes to UN and debates are held and resolutions are passed and prescriptions come up. Phase three is when the matter is not in UN, but efforts are being made to integrate the territory of Jammu and Kashmir through domestic legislation and other initiatives. Phase four is when Shimla agreement enters into place, in, into the scene. And Shimla agreement makes incorporates two different opposing positions and both the sides rely heavily on Shamla agreement different wording which we will examine shortly. And then the question is whether Shamla agreement how far it lasts. And then after that we have yet another phase of the Kashmir issue when UN Security Council resolution 1172 is passed uh, which leading up to present day when there are various discussions of possible resolution of these issues between the heads of states of India and Pakistan. So if that is one approach to, to understand and study the issue of Kashmir, to divide the issue in terms of time zones and then study legal positions of both the parties in each time zone. The other approach is to simply look at the legal arguments or positions taken by the parties in one time zone and compare them with the other and see the conflict or see 
whether which position is vindicated by subsequent events and so on and so forth. So one will have to decide about the approach. The third approach would be just to simply examine the documents and evolve an issue. Not only that, these time zones are there, but there is some common uh, legal uh, common threads which run through all these four, three or four time zones, irrespective of the events, irrespective of the documentation, irrespective of where the issue has been deliberated or debated. For example, the common cord is the argument of self-determination, which irrespective of the time zones, is widely held, on which positions are very clear of both the sides, as a concept itself. Pakistan has been standing up for that right of self-determination. India claims it stands up, but it innovates an interpretation which is contrary to the UN Security Council resolution. And we will see the response of that contrary position by other states as well. Therefore, it is not easy to come to a situation where one can, in a simplified manner, describe the issue of Kashmir. The other common issue which has recently come up is the violation of human rights, which irrespective of the time zones that we have mentioned, one finds it an issue as something which is reoccurring. And more recent issue which India uh, has been clamoring for is the issue of terrorism in that context. Whether it, that legal argument is valid in the case of Kashmir or not, we'll also see that. So I've given you some idea of the whole issue in, in its perspective. And now we go to the specific details of that. And what are the strengths and what are the issues associated with both the sides? And what are the positions that both the sides take? Now for that, I have to go back to the documents because uh, it is not a political speech that we are making here. We are trying to identify the legal issues associated with uh, the issue of Kashmir. And since we are studying the legal aspects of Kashmir, we cannot do that unless we study the legal text which administer various issues of Kashmir issue. Let me start from the instrument of accession. And I have before me some set of those documents that I will be referring to and we will be able to identify those issues. The instrument of accession which is basically the first instrument or the first document that should be the starting point for any person or any student or anyone who wishes to understand the issue of Kashmir is the document which has been executed by Maharaja Hari Singh in his individual capacity as a sovereign of a state. And he says, this one line in the instrument of accession which you will be shown on your screen says, I, such and such, Hari Singh, ruler of Jammu and Kashmir state in the exercise of my sovereignty in and over my said state do hereby execute this my instrument of accession and I hereby declare that I accede to the dominion of India with the intent that the Governor General of India, the Federal Court and etc. etc. Et These are the provisional provisions. So this is the line in the instrument of accession that exceeds or alleges to exceed the state of Jammu and Kashmir to India. This is dated 26th October 1947. It does not mention that whether the Maharaja has taken consent from his people. It does not mention whether what is the nature of the population of Jammu and Kashmir. Do they comprise of predominantly Hindus or do they comprise of Muslims? It is not mentioned. It simply says, I, Maharaja, as being as a sovereign, accede to uh, the Dominion of India. In response to this, on 27th October 1947, writes Lord Mountbatten the most important letter which makes accession condition. Lord Mountbatten says, and the letter would be appearing on your screen, My dear Maharaja Sahib, Your Highness letter 28th October has been delivered to me by Mr. V.P. Menon. In the special circumstances mentioned by Your Highness, my government have decided to accept the accession of Kashmir state to the Dominion of India, inconsistent with their policy, that in the case of any state where the issue of accession has been the subject of dispute, the question of accession should be decided in accordance with the wishes of the people of the state 
it is my government's wish that as soon as law and order have been restored in Kashmir and her soil cleared of the invader, the question of the state succession should be settled by a reference to the people. Now this is that letter and these are those words which when linked up and when read in conjunction with the instrument of succession make it a conditional happening between India and between the Maharaja Hari Singh. And this makes the whole accession itself conditioned on assessment of people's will. There are a lot of other uh, extra legal suspicions with respect to these documents. And these suspicions are, for example, that no one has seen the original instrument of accession. Uh, and when historians have compared the dates, they find it difficult to believe that on 26 October, Hari Singh in Srinagar executes a document which arrives in Delhi the seat of the Viceroy, and the Viceroy is able to respond on, on 27 itself so promptly. But these are the historic issues. We don't go deeper into them. Suffice to say, this shows that the instrument of succession was conditional on the assessment of the wishes of the people of Jammu and Kashmir. Then there is, as I said, uh, a situation where India takes this issue to United Nations. Now, when India takes this matter to United Nations, that's a very interesting legal development. Because India takes it under Chapter 7, under Chapter 6 of the UN Charter, and in which it says it is bringing to the attention of UN Security Council any dispute which is likely to endanger matter between two countries, which will threaten international peace and security. So India takes this matter to the UN Security Council. So on the agenda of UN Security Council, the title of the matter is the India-Pakistan question. Several years later, India argues that this is a wrong title. It was not an issue of dispute between India and Pakistan, but India had gone to Kashmir complaining about the invaders and Security Council, by default, had elevated the dispute as a dispute between two independent states. But by the time, it was too late, because the complaint could have been filed under the provision, and by virtue of the provision of the UN Charter, it had to be termed as a dispute. So, Indian authors, much later, in retrospect, have been critical of this move, and they think that India should not have gone to UN at all, because... It had taken a complaint, and the complaint was processed through the legal mechanism of the UN Charter, by virtue of which it was elevated as an issue between India and Pakistan. But this position of India was not accepted anywhere. It's a position which the Indian authors take, but whether it is accepted, correct or not, is something which has never been decided upon, and... The UN Security Council resolutions, as of today, still hold the field. They have not been specifically set aside anywhere. Then we see, as I mentioned in the introduction, a series of UN resolutions. About 16, 17 UN resolutions were passed uh, till mid 15s And amongst them was a resolution which created UNCIP. This was a resolution 20th January 1948, which says the UN Security Council adopts the following resolution. A commission of the Security Council is hereby established, composed of representatives of the three. And then downward say the commission is invested with a dual function to investigate the facts pursuant to Article 34, and etc., etc. So then there is a series of resolutions, and one such resolution provides in detail the manner of conducting the plebiscite. The government of India should, when it is established to the satisfaction of the commission, set up in accordance with a council resolution that the tribesmen are withdrawing and that arrangements for the secession of the fighting have become effective, put into operation in consultation with the commission a plan for withdrawing their own forces from Jammu and Kashmir and reducing them progressively to the minimum strength required for the support of civil power in the maintenance of law and order. So the obligation was on India to gradually and progressively withdraw, enabling the conduct of the plebiscite. Um, and then not only that, but also subsequently it says, make known that the withdrawal is taking place in stages and announce the completion of each stage. 
that withdrawal never took place. India had its own arguments on that. India blamed Pakistan, that Pakistan's circumstances have changed and so on and so forth. But whatever the case might be, the plebiscite could not be conducted because that withdrawal that was envisaged and based on which uh, eventually uh, uh, see the possibility of conducting the plebiscite could never actually take place. Now, having blocked that situation where, and then United Nations sent various mediators. They were representative of the UN Secretary General. UN Secretary General, by the way, is not merely an individual in his own right. He is a constitutional office under the UN Charter itself. So whenever he acts, he actually acts in discharge of his function under the UN Charter. So the UN Secretary General had been sending representatives to India and Pakistan and to that place, which included highly reputed people, experts, who even gave proposals to resolve these issues, who even made suggestions how to ensure the implementation of these resolutions and how to create more conducive situation on facts. They were General McNaughton. They included Sir Dixon, Dr. Frank Graham, Mr. Jaring, but despite all these efforts, the United Nations could not make a successful effort to, to put into operation its own resolutions that it had passed. Now, when these resolutions were passed, or they were passed and they were not being implemented, they were not being implemented perhaps because India had changed its political strategy. Now the strategy was to incorporate these territories which are being occupied by India. So as, as, as part of that process, a constituent assembly was formulated or it was established in India, in the Indian held uh, Kashmir. That constituent assembly was presented with the instrument of accession and it was asked to ratify that instrument of accession, which it eventually did. And India then said, since the original obligation under Mountbatten's letter and by, by Pandit Nehru in various his speeches was that we will make an assessment, an assessment of the wishes of people of uh, Jammu and Kashmir, we have done that because we have held, we have, uh, we have, established a constituent assembly which includes the people who represent the Kashmiris from our side and these representatives have accepted the instrument of accession, they have ratified it and that's it. We don't require United Nations any longer. Now this argument of India was not accepted not only by Pakistan but also by United Nations and United Nations not only said it administratively but also passed two specific resolutions to that effect. And I think those resolutions are important. Let me quote it from one of them. This was a resolution passed by the UN Security Council on 30th March 1951. And it said, affirming that the convening of a constituent assembly as recommended by the General Council of the All Jammu and Kashmir National Conference and any action that assembly might attempt to take to determine the future shape and affiliation of the entire state or any part thereof would not constitute a disposition of the state in accordance with the above principles. So UN Security Council itself says that any attempt to dis for the disposition of the state through a method other than the plebiscite will not be acceptable. And then in addition to that, there was yet another resolution passed in 1957. This resolution also declined that the modus operandi of constituent assembly ratification was a valid mode to make an assessment or ascertainment of the wishes of people in Kashmir. Now, this resolution says this was adopted on 24th January 1957. And the relevant portion is on your screen, reaffirms the affirmation in its resolution of 1951 and declares 
that the convening of a constituent assembly as recommended by the General Council of Jammu and Kashmir National Conference and any action that assembly may have taken or might attempt to take to determine the future shape and affiliation of the entire state or any part thereof or action by the parties concerned in support of any such action by the assembly would not constitute a disposition of the state in accordance with the above principle. Now this resolution of 1957 and the resolution 1951 are important because they demolished the most important defense raised by India. India said, yes, ratification was conditional on assessment and ascertainment of the wishes of people. Nehru said it, uh, Mountbatten said it, but we have adopted a different method of that ascertainment. Instead of a plebiscite, we are doing it with the Constituent Assembly. But United Nations Security Council itself declined this approach and said, no, this is an invalid method. But despite these two resolutions, uh, which were the legal demolition of the Indian position, India went ahead and made political moves. And as a consequence of that, a ratification was done. And then we come to a time frame when Article 370 of the Indian Constitution was duly amended to incorporate these territories. And Article 370 stands as an evidence of an effort by the India to incorporate Jammu and Kashmir as part of the territories of the Union of India. There are a lot of other associated arguments whether that incorporation is correct, whether the gradual application of Indian laws to this area is there, we will not go into that. But since it is important to register that resolutions are an evidence of the dispute, they are also at the same time giving a methodology of making the ascertainment of wishes. For the ascertainment of that methodology, various modes were adopted, various representatives of the United Nations came to this region, made an effort to resolve, could not resolve. Then India took a different position, completely different from what it has itself been agreeing to. And then later on, uh, it adopted a mechanism of ratification by Constituent Assembly and, uh, and having Article 370 in place uh, demonstrating incorporation of the territory to uh, subject to the claim and protest by Pakistan. So this was the position or the legal position as it was evolving uh, in, in 1950s. The other important event that one finds is the Tashkent Declaration. The Tashkent Declaration does not mention the issue of Jammu and Kashmir. Neither it gives any indication about the fate of the UN Security Council resolution. Neither it gives a very clear indication of what parties intend to do with that issue. So then we move on to another important instrument or another important uh, legal instrument which then addresses the issue of Kashmir directly. That is the Shimla Agreement. Shimla Agreement is important because it becomes an important uh, legal venue through which India and Pakistan adopt two different courses. The interpretation of Shimla Agreement. India, after 1971 war, took a political decision that it shall no further report violations of ceasefire to the UN observer mission which is posted there. And it will not have any United Nations involvement. Pakistan, on the other hand, continued to argue strongly that till such time UN Security Council resolutions are not specifically displaced, they continue to hold the field and they continue to be operational. And therefore, there is no point in arguing that UN SC resolutions are not applicable to the dispute in question. Civil Agreement 1972 may hamare This agreement may do aise alag alag nakat hai jo दोनों स्टेट्स की पोजीशंस को वाजे करते हैं मैं सबसे पहले आपको वो रेफरेंस सुनाना चाहता हूं जिस पर इंडिया रिलाय करता है टू आर्ग्यू दैट यूनाइटेड नेशंस की सिक्योरिटी काउंसिल की रेजोल्यूशंस ऑब्सोल्यूट हो गई हैं और अब शिमला एग्रीमेंट विल गवर्न द डिस्प्यूट दैट इज पैरा 4 ऑफ द शिमला एग्रीमेंट 
پیرا فور کے سب پیرا ٹو میں یا پیرا فور پورا پڑھ لیتے ہیں تاکہ کانٹیکس کلیئر ہو جائے پارٹیز اگری اب میں پڑھتا ہوں ان آرڈر ٹو انیشیئر دا پروسیس آف اسٹیبلشمنٹ آف ڈیوریبل پیس بوتھ دا گورنمنٹس اگری دیٹ ون انڈیا اینڈ پاکستانی فورسز شیل بی وڈ ڈرون ٹو دیئر سائڈ آف دا انٹرنیشنل بارڈر یہاں تک تو بات بڑی کلیئر ہے ٹو وین کمز دا ایشو ان جموں اینڈ کشمیر دا لائن آف کنٹرول ریزلٹنگ فرام دا سیز فائر آف ڈسمبر سیونٹین نائنٹین سیونٹی ون shall be respected by both the sides without prejudice to the recognized position of either side. Neither side shall seek to alter it unilaterally, irrespective of mutual differences and legal interpretations. So, Goya, the line of control which is emanating or which is stemming from the para 4 has to be respected. And then it also shows this provision or this line that neither side shall be respected by both the sides without prejudice to the recognized position of either side. It means the issue is still tentative in nature. Then we go to paragraph 6. Both governments agree that their respective heads will meet again at a mutually convenient time in the future and that in the meanwhile the representatives of the two sides shall meet to discuss further the modalities and arrangements for the establishment of durable peace and normalization of relations including the questions of repatriation of prisoners of war and civil treatment, a final settlement of Jammu and Kashmir and the resumption of diplomatic relations. This is what India relies upon. A final settlement of Jammu and Kashmir because Para 6 is saying that the government will get to meet the government and will get to meet the government. The final settlement of Jammu and Kashmir will also see the diplomatic resumption of relationships. So India says, Since Pakistan and India have contracted out of the UNSC resolution, therefore UNSC resolution has become obsolete and now we have to move on and only resolve this issue bilaterally. Pakistan, on the other hand, relies upon the initial portion of the Simla agreement and says no. That is not what the intention of Pakistan was and that is not what can be legally interpreted to be. Pakistan relies on para 1, sub para 1 of the Simla agreement should be now displayed on your screen. The principles and purposes of the Charter of the United Nations shall govern the relations between the two countries. So this means that the principles of the Charter will actually govern the relationship between the two countries. Principles mein kya hai? Wo UN resolutions which are pursuant to the Charter. Resolutions that we Pakistan relies upon are pers issued pursuant to the Charter itself. And Pakistan further argues that the Simla agreement nowhere says that the resolutions which have been passed by the UN are no longer valid to the extent of Pakistan. Simla agreement does not anywhere says that Pakistan and India will no longer rely on those resolutions. Simla agreement nowhere says that Pakistan and India uh, will not have recourse to those resolutions in any form. It merely says, as an additional measure, possibly, that it could be removed, it could be resolved bilaterally. But the mere fact that it said it in Para 6 does not diminish the intrinsic legal strength of a resolution of the UN Security Council passed under the UN Charter itself. No member state or no group of member state can simply diffuse a resolution through a bilateral or a, even a multilateral agreement. Those resolutions have been give, to be given validity and they have to be recognized. So similar agreement was again a legal instrument which was basis of interpretation of two dif different conflicting legal issues between India and Pakistan. It has not been adjudicated anywhere, but the state practice and international law is that whenever there is a conflict between an obligation of the states arising from a bilateral agreement, a conflict with a, an obligation under the UN Charter, the obligation under the UN Charter shall prevail. Then we move on to the Lahore Declaration. Lahore Declaration was again a set of uh, legal instruments which again mentioned Kashmir and the issue was uh, whether the issue of Jammu and Kashmir has to be resolved by the parties. This was a time frame, or from here onwards was a time frame, around this time frame, when India was very reluctant even to have a 
a discussion in Kashmir with Pakistan. Uh, and this reluctance was based on political reasoning. India did not want to get involved in the issue further. It wanted to conclude. It wanted to uh, completely displace Pakistan from all legal rights. It did not want even to give any of these rights to the Kashmiris as such. But this political positioning or this political strategy of the Indian government uh, received a jolt when in 1998 UN Security Council passed yet another important resolution. This resolution passed by the UN Security Council was in the context of the nuclear explosions that India and Pakistan had carried out in 1998. And these nuclear explosions uh, were done and as a consequence of those explosions, the UN Security Council passed a resolution, of course, condemning both India and Pakistan. But in that process, this resolution also mentioned Kashmir specifically and, uh, uh, and said that this is an issue which needs to be resolved between the two countries of India and Pakistan. So after a period of several decades, I would say, the matter of Kashmir returned to UN Security Council on account of the nuclear explosions and found its mention in the UNSC Resolution 1172. Where is the Kashmir issue today? And where is the conceptual framework of Kashmir issue now? The conceptual framework of Kashmir issue or the centerpiece of the conceptual framework has been the right of self-determination. Pakistan has always maintained that this is a, such a fundamental right of people that there cannot be two arguments about it. It has to be granted, it has to be protected, and assistance even has to be extended for realization of this right and the extension of the assistance for the realization of this right is also permissible under international law. And not only that, but even force can be utilized for the realization of this right. And those who actually resort to force for realization of right of self-determination have been given a legitimate uh, legal space for doing that. And that cannot be categorized as an act of terrorism. India has tried to restrict the right of self-determination in one form or the other. And it is very reluctant to allow this right to prosper in a conceptual sense. But India received, I would say, another jolt when it, when it made an effort to put across its interpretation or restricted interpretation of this right in the form of a reservation to the covenant and civil and political rights. Basically, when India ratified this covenant, it made an effort to place a reservation. And this reservation was on one of the articles, which was Article 1, which gave all people all over the world the right of self-determination. India's restrictive interpretation of the right of self-determination was as follows. The government of India declares that the words of the right of self-determination appearing in this article, which means the covenant, in a word treaty to human rights, shall apply only to the people under foreign domination and that these words do not apply to sovereign independent states or to a section of a people or nation which is the essence of national integrity. So now this was an effort to restrict the interpretation of the argument of self-determination. This was not accepted by several countries. Government of France, government of Netherlands, government of Germany made official uh, comments uh, denouncing and arguing that the position taken by the Indian government trying to restrict the right of self-determination was legally incorrect. Let me read out as a specimen the objections by only one of the governments. France, the government of the Republic takes objection to the reservation entered by the government of India to Article 1 of the International Covenant on Economic, Social and Cultural Rights as this reservation attaches conditions not provided for by the Charter of the UN to the exercise of the right of self-determination. 
the present declaration will not be deemed to be an obstacle to the entry into force of the covenant between the French government, Republic and the Republic of India. In other words, uh, several governments argued that this is not a correct way to restrict the right. So here is an evidence, apart from the political position where the government of Pakistan takes or people who write on these issues take in a political sense, uh, here is an evidence of a legal character which demonstrates the right of self-determination which has been restrictively taken by India is incorrectly taken, that position is incorrect and right of self-determination cannot be subject to any condition and so on and so forth. And not only this right is free or this right is widely is wide, it has to be protected and it has to be even protected by third parties. If the need be, the third parties can make an effort to intervene and protect this right. Uh, the issue of Kashmir is, is, is an ongoing issue. There are several other associated issues with that. One such issue is the issue of terrorism. And the Indians have made an effort to paint that those who fight for the freedom struggle, those who fight for the freedom objectives, or those who want to avail the right of self-determination are people who are terrorists. The international law does not recognize such people as terrorists. International law creates space for such people and allows them to use force as and when there is necessity to do so. Of course, they have to, uh, uh, they have to comply with certain basic elementary norms of that force that, that is not targeted against civilians, that is not targeted against um, uh, unarmed personnel, etc., etc. But barring that, that condition, the right to use force for realizing self-determination is validly recognized under international law. This recognition is obvious in several UN resolutions, UN General Assembly resolutions. At this stage, let me also tell you that UN General Assembly resolutions which document such positions, that document such uh, international law uh, concept are, are, are resolutions which have the status of evidence of international law in that area. So, insofar as the argument of the Indian government is concerned that this is, this is that those who fight for self-determination should be branded as terrorism, it is not acceptable. It is not accepted not only by Pakistan, but also by the international community. The other important aspect to the issue of Kashmir is the violation of human rights by the Indian forces for the last so many years. Uh, this violation has been persistent. This violation has been regular. And the complaints have not only been registered by Pakistan or they have been taken note of in Pakistan, but they have been taken note of by all human rights uh, related entities all over the world and various states which monitor human rights situation have been taking note of that. There is yet another important legal dimension to this process that the situation in the occupied Kashmir is a situation of what we call a non-international armed conflict or a conflict which has a non-international nature but it is effectively a conflict where Geneva Conventions are applicable, where all other customary law relating to international humanitarian law is applicable. Uh, and that is a position which, which is existing in India on the Indian side of occupied Kashmir, despite all that. The other important uh, uh, feature of the issue of Kashmir is that the representatives of the Kashmiris have not been given due legal recognition uh, on the Indian side, although Pakistan has been stating as a, almost as a state position, that Kashmiris are also stakeholders in the issue of Kashmir and they must be given a right of hearing, a right of representation and even a right of proper participation should there be a resolution of issue of Kashmir. I hope that uh, the session that we've had today would be, uh, would, be uh, would be enabling you to have a legal review of the Kashmir issue, uh, which I have tried to give. I am sure I must have missed out a lot because it is not easy to summarize Kashmir in 55 minutes. I have only concentrated on some of those legal issues which are of significant nature and without which one cannot 
discuss or complete the analysis, of, legal analysis of Kashmir, and I have picked up on the selective documents to put across uh, the uh, legal aspects of the political position by both the states. Uh, as I said, one may be missing out a lot, but I hope that whatever has been included in this discussion or in this lecture today would be enough from your point of view to prepare yourself and to have an informed analysis on the issue of Kashmir. Thank you very much.